Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to Good Stuff. Appreciate you, as always, joining us today and spending some time with us. Um, just a quick plug once again, when you get a chance, head on over to Good Stuff with Kevin on YouTube and subscribe. Uh, you'll see now 26 videos and, and a bunch of others, uh, and what will be number 27 after today. Um, so, yeah, we're really looking forward to staying in touch with you and hearing your comments on everything. It's been great. Well, I, I'm happy to, uh, to have Zach Jackson uh, with us today, he's uh, Browns and NFL writer for The Athletic, host of the A to Z podcast, and uh, really looking forward to uh, talking about his book, uh, 100 Things Browns Fans uh, Should Know and Do Before They Die. And we'll get to some of that at the end. Zach, man, it's great to have you. Hey, I've never been ranked better than 27th in anything in my life, so I feel like it's good to be here. Yeah, that's good. That. <laughs> Well, hey, I, I know uh, just just being in the sports world for the most part all my life. Some people say they love sports, but man, you, you love sports, right? Um, kind of <laughs> just kind of tell us when did that start for you? Like, how how did that how did that all come about? Well, my mom says I was reading the sports page when I was three years old. So you know, obviously, I don't remember that, but uh, I don't think she's making that up. So, like as a kid, that's just what I loved uh, reading the sports page and watching ESPN and following and playing like. Of course, I played video games like every kid, but only sports games, you know, um, just always doing that. It's all I really ever cared about. And then middle school, early into high school, um, you know, I kind of had some people, a teacher specifically, say you have a writing talent. You know, this is something you should pursue. Uh, you know, more into high school, it became clear that I wasn't going to make the NBA as a player. So it was like, let's see if I can do this. So, um, you know, I tell it's an example of somebody who knew what they wanted to do from a very early age and went out and chased it. You know, the path has changed so much for people in my business, um, for how you do it. And, you know, it's just, it's, it's cool. Um, it's unsettling. <laughs> you know, I have 46 of my coworkers laid off. Um, I've been, you know, through 20 years actually in the business, I feel like I've been just ahead of the curve. Um, just in the right spot to know how it used to be, hopefully to know, you know, what's next. But yeah, Kevin, I mean, everything I've ever done has been sports related. And as you get a little older, it's like, well, this is what I'm qualified to do more than what I always wanted to do. So I guess I'm fortunate that, you know, the two things uh, merge. And so these last five or six months have been very strange with no sports uh, for the most part, but the shows have gone on, the writing's gone on. And, um, you know, hopefully we're getting back safely, and efficiently um to our new normal and, and that includes sport so i'd be interested to know you know just in all these years like what's your thoughts on like how do you gain respect and credibility in your field you know that i think that's something that's probably important and then where's the balance of you know gathering that information um and reporting it with developing good relationships well i think credibility is the key word you know um, if someone tells you something and asks you to, that it's off the record or that you keep it to yourself you you have to do that you know um, when you're dealing with something delicate and like I say all the time like the awesome part of my job is I've covered the final four right I've covered the NFL yeah. playoffs I've covered in LeBron James the bad part of my job is you call people when they're fired you know I've been to funerals cover funerals of people I don't know um, and right now in social media where there's such a race to be first you know, you know, something's going on and, and we're all attached digitally more than ever, right? It's not hard to get someone's um, phone number, or if it is, you just send them a direct message on Facebook or Twitter. So you have to know um, that you can be trusted with that information. Um, you have to trust that you're getting the right information. And, and, and it's just about being accurate, honestly. I, I really think that one dumb tweet or one wrong um, breaking news when you're in a rush to break it can can ruin your credibility forever I, I, well, you, you said something really key to me you said you know rush to be first and then you talked about accuracy so there's two different things yes you know and so there are some people that could care less about the accuracy and all are about the rush to be first and it's like there's almost not a consequence sometimes when they are first because people have forgotten it 30 seconds later or a day later or whatever right yeah that, that's right and, and that's kind of the battle we all go through um, when you think you're breaking a story at this point, there's a rush involved to it. Like you, you feel it's the adrenaline, like I, I'm going to have this, but if you're going to go ahead and do it without multiple sources, without knowing hundred percent sure, 
and adrenaline is also met by some real nerves, some real anxiety on things like, hey, did I get this right? You know? Yeah. So I, I think that's the thing. I tell young people that want to get in this, like, obviously you would like to write that memorable story, right? You would like to break that huge scoop. But the most important thing is if your school newspaper sends you to, to cover the JV baseball game between Hobart and Firestone. Get the names right. Get the yeah. score right. If you talk to the coach afterwards, please quote him accurately and correctly, you know? So it's the basics of journalism have not changed. How it's delivered and how people consume it, what they crave, what they want, what they argue about, how they pass it along has certainly changed. But it's still about getting the basics right and knowing. And, and I really think that being credible, being trustworthy is the most important thing in, in this business. And then, of course, in, in rising in this business. Yeah, for sure. What are like, I'd be anxious to know, uh, you know, we talk about habits on here and like routines, and but like, what are some, some specific things um, that, you know, that you can do to grow and get better in, in, in your field um, that even, even though it's your field too, could be relatable to other people maybe? Well, I think you, you just have to network and that goes back to credibility. Um, that goes back to people knowing that you do good work. Um, this is not woe is me, but the Browns fire everyone like every 18 months. So it becomes very difficult. Um, I can tell you one story I've broken in 2020 about the Browns hiring their offensive coordinator. The scoop did not come from someone in the NFL. It came from someone out, out of the business. And then it's like, okay, go back and, um, you know, confirm this with someone in the business. Now you mm -hmm. can go. And so then three weeks later, I'm at the combine and then I meet Alex Van Pelt and he says, oh, you're the guy who had this first. How'd you do that? <laughs> you know? So yeah, it, it's, it's just, I, I believe Kevin and it's obviously hard now in this pandemic. I believe in being there, you know, so much is so impersonal, but I believe in going and meeting coaches, administrators, general managers, front office people, getting in front of them. And, you know, you can ask for their phone number. They can tell you no. You can send them a direct message or a text message or however you got it. You don't know if they're going to respond or not. But I just believe in, in being there and shaking hands. And again, like this, this is all different. Uh, and it's been so strange. But I just believe the face-to-face -face interview, the face-to-face -face interaction is, is how you build it. If you have a scoop, you know, if you're a college AD or you're a rising NFL assistant coach, like you have to know me and trust me to get it. Mm -hmm. You don't know where it's going to go. And, uh, you know, some teams, they get mad if they don't get to break the news. Um, I don't think if they really are going to hire an offensive coordinator, and I don't really think they're going to rescind their decision if he lets it out via NFL Network or the Athletic or whatever before the team does. But it's all about kind of the protocol and the culture of everything. And, you know, unfortunately – uh, there is kind of a divide there. The information is so sensitive um, for some of these, these teams that it's tough, but at the same time, I think you get there by just, like I said, just, just knowing and just being accurate and being up front. Mm -hmm. uh, I've had awkward conversations with, with, with a lot of people, yeah. you know, but this is the news and um, it's our job to report it accurately. Yeah, for sure. Now you just alluded to things being different, of course, through everything like, what has been like the biggest adjustment for you right now? Well, uh, you know, so far um, we haven't had open locker room time, but we're not going to have that. You mm -hmm. know, every interaction we've had with Browns, anything has been by Zoom. So, so that's, that's been the biggest thing. Um, in a way, like specifically going back to the draft process when all this was new, it was good because people were actually accessible to their phones, you know, instead mm -hmm. of sitting yeah. in our meetings all day. Right. Right. But, um, you know, it's just different when you're not there, when you're not seeing it. And, you know, we're still 14 days from Kevin Stefanski coaching his first real practice. You know, normally they would have had 15 or so. Yeah, about 15 or 16 full squad practices in the spring. They would have had on top of that six weeks where the guys were around and could go through drills and have formal meetings and informal meetings. So everything has kind of changed there. And you know, the way we go about it, whether we're getting a scoop or just trying to get that next piece of the story is so different because we're not going to get one-on-one -on -one access to the guys. Right. We're going to have to rely on the Zooms. We're going to have to rely on networking and things like that to get more um, than the actual story. So what would you say to people that are listening? Like, what's, 
what's been your biggest lesson or even advice that you give based on adjustments because you're constantly making them not knowing what tomorrow will bring right yeah um you know i guess it's just always make that extra call you know uh if i'm writing about john smith the browns and the tackle you know make that extra call don't just trust mm -hmm. what is it says, right you, you want to build a relationship with that agent sure but call the high school coach call the college coach um double mm -hmm. check Team, teams have pr staff for a reason and if you're going to you know, at our company, especially now with COVID and whatever, we have installed extra layers of things you have to check if you're going to go with a sensitive story. But to me, you need to do that on your own. And it, and it goes back to the rub is we're trying to be first, right? We're trying to get ours tweeted. We're trying, trying to get it out there. Right. But you just have to be sensitive to, to everything that's going on. And, you know, I, I think just this summer, I think I've missed out on a story because I couldn't get a second person to confirm, you know? Um, is it a big deal in the scope of things? No. Uh, I just think you you have to be thorough in being right. It's much more important than being first. Well, what about the other thing? I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on this. I, I'm really big on, hey, this is what I can control. This is what I don't control. So I'm not going to spend my time over there. And I think right now, a lot of people are getting so wrapped up and consumed to your point earlier, with what they don't control and it impacts them, some without them even knowing that. You're in something where, well, we all are, let's face it, like you don't know if there's going to be NFL, you know what I mean? But you have zero control over that. So what's your advice or thoughts when it comes to that philosophy? Um, don't get angry and go on Facebook. <laughs> That's what I would say. <laughs> you know? Uh, but no, from sure. a, yeah, I, I, I mean... You know, like I said, I, I've talked to people through this and I, I've like college coaches, for example, I, I usually cover the NFL, but if I have a story, I have a story and they've said, Hey, this is going to happen. You know, this announcement's coming down. Well, if, if I don't know, or if someone doesn't want that out there, or if I can't triple confirm that, I'm not going to run with that. Kevin, I've also had college coaches contact me and say, what are you hearing? Do you know, like it, it, nobody knows what's next right. in, in the sports business. It's probably changing forever, or at least for the foreseeable future. So, yeah, uh, I mean, with our company, at first it was like, oh, rah, rah, we can do this. We can write compelling stuff. We can keep people coming in. And then the realities were that we were getting killed. People weren't subscribed. People have real life issues. There's no sports to cover. So, you know, I don't know what the immediate future of my job is. I, I, I think there's going to be an NFL season, and we all hope it'll be a full NFL season. And we all hope by early 2021 we'll be back in doing this. But that's all out of my control. So the first day we're allowed to go watch the Browns, I'm going to go watch the Browns. You know, later right. today, if he's on Zoom, and it's my job to write something as compelling as can be from, from what he yeah. tells us about this. You know, one of the things I'm going to ask him, unless somebody beats me to it, like, are the, do you let the quarterbacks be together? Or do you really keep them mm -hmm. separate? Because if three quarterbacks get COVID and you have a game on yeah. Sunday, you know, all of a sudden you're playing the undrafted rookie from Princeton. So. Um, I, I think in a way, Kevin, my job doesn't change. It's to know, it's to be as confident as I can be with my, with what I know about the team, about the league, with what's going on, and then try to turn that into something interesting. And, and, and that becomes a rub. Like there's a line between asking the compelling and pertinent question and trying to be a jackass, yeah, right? right. Um, in a group Zoom, there's a line between, okay, everybody's getting the same few things and kind of writing the same stories. How do I ask this if I have this great story idea and I'm trying to keep it from someone else? Mm -hmm. these, these are factors um, that we all have. I mean, again, it's kind of out of our control. I, I have a, a player, I could see my phone light up a second ago. He gave me his high school basketball coach's number and his college position coach's number. So I call those guys. They don't know me. I don't know them. I don't right. know if it's great interview i hope it is i hope i can turn it into something that nobody else has but i don't know um you know if they don't respond to my messages right if they don't call me back what's the line when do i quit calling and trying yeah how awkward is it if they finally if they come up and say and i don't think it's going to happen in this case because the player gave me the person's name and number specifically but i've called and said hey coach um you know in, in such and such year you coach these three guys in the all-star game uh, such and such all-star game. They're all in the draft this year. What do you think? And glowing about the first two guys and then saying, yeah. I don't have anything to say about, you know, Joe Smith, the third guy. <laughs> That's awkward. Mm -hmm. That's weird. But it's out there and it's why you do the thorough work. Well, and you mentioned that 
I think something you mentioned that was key there, your, your job doesn't change. I, I think a lot of people can relate to that, you know, and, and hence complacency, boredom, however you want to look at that, you know, so where do you get the inspiration when it's the same routine over and over and over again? <laughs> Um, that's, it, that's a great question. Uh, I'm not sure I have a great answer to it. Um, it's, it's what you do. It's what you love to do. And it's my job to, like I said, to, to be compelling, to be accurate, to be different without going over the line, um, in this market, right? I, I, I need to make people say without insulting any of my peers, that they want to read me. Well, why, what do I know? How do I deliver it? That's different. So that all doesn't change. Um, it's super challenging because there has not been a practice yet. So the assignment comes last week from the national desk. Hey, we have to have 53 man roster projections. Okay. That's great. Well, normally I've watched four practices during yeah, the right. spring and I know who they like, you know, do, the, do any of these rookies have a chance to be ready mm -hmm. in five weeks? I don't know that answer. Um, and as I, and as I've told friends who were coaches and scouts before, like, one of the differences between me and you is you guys have to be right. I don't. Yeah, so, right. <laughs> um, it's it's kind of how it is, and you know we're we're banking on the thirst for football, the excitement, without people actually being able to go out to training camp, without being able to turn on the preseason game, fall in love with the long shot, or see you know Baker more comfortable, or how the rookie left tackles coming along. Mm -hmm. So we'll see all all that goes. Um, the NFL is its own monster. College football is its own economy, as we're all being reminded of almost daily at this point. And, and I think people want it and people want to see it. So there's still plenty of right, plenty for us to write about, to talk about, to cover. And, um, you know, if it's just packaged differently, if the timing of it is differently, or if we have to talk more about business things, about safety things, when we like to be talking about who's the third safety or who's the third corner or, you know, should so-and-so be traded then, you know, that's just how it's going to be. Right. And, and I think ultimately, Zach, the one thing, it's what we started talking about here today. I think the thing that keeps you probably going every day in that routine is your passion for this, right? You love it. And, and that's a, I guess, where I would just interject to people that are listening is to, it's, it's your why and, and what you do. And I think that's important. And, and you did mention that you don't have to be right. I get that. I, I totally get it. But yeah. How have mistakes that you've made or failures that you've encountered made you better at what you do? Oh, uh, I just think the next time you, you go through and you say, hey, maybe I, I don't need to be this strong with it, with this opinion. You know, um, you know, I've had people call and say, hey, uh, I read your article and I don't think you're being fair to this group for this GM, for example, because here's what he inherited. So I just think you make sure you're laying out both sides, you know, uh, right now on July, whatever the heck day it is, 2020, I think the Browns have a chance to be really good on offense. And I think the defense, right. So, um, you know, am I probably wrong? Is the truth always kind of in the middle in the NFL? You know, we'll see. Um, I, I guess what I'm trying to say by that is Kevin, I, I don't need to go on and attack a, a player's personal character and makeup right? Um, or say that I don't think that this coach has a chance, but I can say, hey, until I actually see them tackle somebody, I'm not sure that they're going to, <laughs> you know? Um, these are strange circumstances for everyone. They play Lamar Jackson in the first game. Like, he's going to yeah. start at 1 o'clock and still be running at 4.30. I think. Maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, right. um, you know, I, I would say I've had very few actual contentious moments, but I am going to always be certain that if I'm writing something about it, it's time to move on from a certain coach, it's time to move on from a certain player, or they really blew this. I'm going to be as fair in my presentation as that. I'm not going to let it go lightly. Um, I'm just not, because you have to take into account that these are people, these are jobs, and that, you know, this is, this is my opinion. The Browns have never paid me for my opinion. Even when I worked for the team, it was down the middle, right? They never asked me for a football decision. So this is how I present it, and, um, you know, we'll see how it goes. Yeah, for sure. Now, now the people, you're, you're around a lot of uh, successful people, high-level achievers, how, however you want to put it, uh, whether that's the, the people in your field, um, you know, whether that's players, whether that's coaches. 
Is there one thing or even a couple things maybe? Um, and heck, man, let, let's let's go back to, you know, Jim France at Manchester. Let's throw him in there. I mean, what is it about all these people that sticks out? Is there something that you see that is consistent uh, and anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, I, I mean, I think they have their core beliefs, you know, in, in, in how to do it. Um, Jim Francis run the ball, right? Urban Meyer, it's just recruit really good players and, and you know, just push, push them to be the best. Um, you know, I, I think it's a consistency in what you do. I think it starts with a work ethic, Kevin, a willingness to do it. Uh, um, you know, Josh McDaniels, when he, he took a job, I think in the steel industry, right. Um, and when he took the internship basically with the Patriots, I don't know if it was called an internship or not. He thought it would help him get the McKinley job, you know, and he was right. Like, so I, I think there's a, you get in, you learn. So it's just a willingness to learn, to work, and to go. And of course, these guys get big egos, right? Of course, they rely on their friends along the way. But I think, I think the best ones, they, they, they combine smarts and savvy with just what they believe and how it should be done and let it go from there. So um, it's been interesting to meet all these coaches, right? And there's a there's hundred different personality types and, and things like that. Um, sometimes do I think I see through guys? Sure. Sometimes am I wrong in that? Sure. Uh, I think the best, I think the very best guys just, they, they, they drill what they believe in and they work to set the tone for everyone around them to get the work done. Because I, I would say this, like even in college football, we, we know the three schools recruit the best players, right? Well, without, without doing the work and without building that team concept, you don't, you don't get there. Um, and the NFL seasons go off the rails quickly. Everybody's got good players, right? Some mm -hmm. teams have great players, but you have to have that that real belief. And I just think the best head coaches in the NFL are willing to listen to guys. They're willing to delegate certain things, mm -hmm. and their beliefs are what they are. And you know, they're able to over time, you know, get the right people around them who will stick stick with those things. Yeah, it's almost, I, I think I just go to just a great deal of conviction in what you're saying, you know, with, with what it is that they're doing. Um, you don't fool players. You don't, you know. What's you that? Just, you don't fool players. Oh, no, coach, no, no, yeah, right. Writer, you know, <laughs> as another player, like they know. Um, sometimes, I would say this, sometimes you get lucky and you can do it like an anonymous survey type thing uh, in the locker room. And sometimes guys don't want to talk about it for whatever reason. But the way to find out who really are the five best players or who really are the five hardest working players on any team, high school, basketball, NFL, is to yeah. ask the player. Right? Talk the, coach player, yeah. an the parent has an answer. The writer right. who's a practice every third day has an answer, but the players know who's the team. Well, yeah. And I mean, I, being at the levels that I were, I, I could, I could ask kids to, Hey, in, in the basketball locker, label one to 12, the best players. And, and, and you know, <laughs> If I was the seventh best player, I would have put that. Now, my mom would have thought I was the first, but that they all would have known. You know, I, I would have liked to do that every year and then hand it out before the year started or weekly because they they definitely would have known. But, well, hey, I, th I think the one thing that, that people probably that are listening that would really want to know is just a, an inside look, if you will. I mean, the Browns organization, just what it's been through. I mean – I don't know if we're able to agree, but I guess one word that comes up to me is dysfunctional. You know, we're talking about the successes and failures of some things with you, but like, you know, why is it like, wh what is it? What, why, why can it change? And, and why does it somewhat stay consistent? I mean, it seems to be moving in the right direction, but yet we don't know this guy, like you said, hasn't coached a game yet. I know they've assembled some more talent, yada, yada, but there's a history here of a consistently dysfunctional organization. Do you want the two or three hour answer or the two or three minute answer? <laughs> depends, on, depends on how long your mom wants to listen or anything. <laughs> yeah, so um, they've had just so much change, Kevin. And some of that is because they've drafted the wrong guys or hired the wrong guys. Um, but also the flip side of that is you have to stick with them, right? You don't just, especially with millionaires and egos involved, you don't just build a culture by bringing in new guys who are smarter than everybody or better than everybody. Because it's not that easy. So they haven't stuck with anything. Um, they've made some outrageous hires. And I think through the ownership changes and through, you know, the, the common thread and pulling the plug on guys is 
you know, guys get too power hungry or, um, you know, majoring in the minor, you know, just worried about uh, other things. It is so hard to build an NFL team full of 21, 22 year olds who are making rich for the first time and meld them with 29, 30 year olds who know the younger guys are coming for their jobs, right? Those checks are drying up. But if you don't have core things you're going to stick with and good guys and good people who understand that it's the players and the coaches and the executives that matter. I mean, there has just been so much ego, so much off field crap and so much, you know, just pulling the plug. Um, there were a million, million red flags, a million reasons not to draft Johnny Manziel. They did it. <laughs> right. Um, you know, they're going all the way back. Like Butch Davis would tell Tim Couch he was the guy one day and he would tell Kelly Holcomb he was the guy the next day. And neither of them were the guy. They went to Jeff Garcia. He wasn't the guy. You know, Butch got fired or, or quit and still got paid. Um, it, that's a, it's a broad question and I could keep going. Right, um, I get that. I, I would say this. Here at month six, I'm really, really impressed by Kevin Stefanski and Andrew Barry as people. Right. Mm -hmm. Does that matter? I don't know. Um, they've certainly encountered an unprecedented thing here with this pandemic and the way the off season's gone and the season still kind of in limbo. Certainly, even if we go through training camp, it's not going to be the same. Right. But they have not encountered that first football thing where player is unhappy because he's not getting the ball. Right. Um, player is unhappy because he should be getting paid more than, than such and such in the locker room. Um, so and so is not putting in the work. And again, yeah. the players know what's going yeah, on. Right. right now. Um, you add to that some of the front office stuff where they've had, and it's in the lawsuits, you know, they, they have had just about everything. Uh, I really believe this. I, I don't say this, this is kind of funny, but I really don't say it lightly. A threshold the Browns have to cross in becoming a relevant team is that everything you hear, right, on a podcast, on Twitter, and talking to whoever, you have to get past where everything's believable. And that's, yeah. you know, front office employees being too big for their britches. That's, you know, players, you know, just abandoning the coach or not putting in the work. That's mm -hmm. signing the wrong guys to huge contracts. And that's like everyone in that locker room knows what every other guy in that locker room knows. And even yeah. when you're way under the salary cap or even when you're building for the future, if that guy that's the second highest paid player on the team isn't playing and working like the second highest paid player on the team, that'll eat your culture from the inside out. You know, and it's right. So that that takes some real maturity, some real wisdom, some real patience, probably some luck. The Browns have had none of those. Um, in some cases, they flat out hired the wrong people in key positions. Those people have hired their buddies. Their culture's been rotten from the inside out. In some cases, they pulled the plug on those people and never get into there. So. I truly, truly, truly believe in Barry and Stefanski, and I want to sit here and tell you and everybody that's watching that believing in them as people will ultimately that they have to make the right football decisions. They have to get the guys on the same page. And I just thought last year they were just so immature as a team. You know? <laughs> and I just thought I can keep going. <laughs> you know, and I think it goes back to – yeah, I know for sure. But I think two things that stick out to me, we, we talked about it earlier with having conviction and what that is. And ultimately, it does start at the top of the leadership and creating that culture. And I know that's a buzzword, but that, that's a real thing. And everything you're talking about is encompassed under that okay. umbrella. So I, I think that's I think that's really important. Hey, I'd like to, I'd well, like to talk, I, I you know, about this here. Um, you know, it's something uh, I've wanted to do. I mean, simply, so this, you know, this why, summer, why did Kevin, you write? 20 summers that I've been around the well, I, I started as an intern when I was 20 years old on the team website was branded like we we you know social media wasn't out there um uh, you know all these other ways now the teams reach fans weren't out there so i worked for the team for 10 years and then in my various yeah. jobs since i've covered the team sometimes on a daily hourly basis sometimes more for a while but uh triumph books reached out said we, we want you to do this um i, I like the format uh, and, and it was it was good to get um, tell some old stories and tie some things together. I learned a lot, stuff I'd forgotten, stuff I'd misplaced. And it was just a really good experience. So, um, you know, not right now uh, am I ready to dive in and do another book, but I do have some this. I thought that was good. So it's actually the third book that I've done. It's the first one that's been professionally. But I do have some 
thought that was really similar. Well, what one, would? Um, well, it's just such a different discipline. What, what would be you know, your? Um, you when you're writing for the internet, what, like, what it's would be writing. your one takeaway? You know, and, and occasionally, uh, or more than occasionally, uh, hopefully, you get the chance to dive deeply on some things or take people back. But you're usually writing about right now, and specifically in covering today's NFL, you're usually writing about tomorrow more than anything else. So. Um, just, just to carve out the time to do it, um, to present this sad history of the New Era Browns, but be fair about it, right? Um, not to beat people over the head with it, because Browns fans know, so they're not going to buy the book if I'm going to rub their noses in it for 80 chapters, right? So it was, it was a really cool challenge to do that. And then, you know, even, even if I, I work for a great company, right? But in today's journalism world, we all work for ourselves. We all brand ourselves. Uh, we all put ourselves out there. Any idiot can have a podcast. I have three of them. I'm, I'm proof of that, right? So, you know, yeah. So, uh, you know, to get out there and and say, I'm going to go do this book signing. And frankly, I had two of them canceled by COVID. Um, to get out there and sign my name to that stuff. And, you know, to make time to drive to Youngstown and sign books, not knowing if more than six people are going to show up. Luckily, eight or nine showed up. So that was great. <laughs> um, all of that was just a great, like, kind of personal challenge to take that yeah. on. And, you know, if in six months the, the, the check's coming and it's, it's more than a couple bucks, that's great. But I just thought it was cool and I had my name attached to it. Um, you know, books do still live forever and uh, so hopefully that will. And, you know, we'll see, um, you know, what my next one is. Like I said, I, I have a couple ideas. Uh, and one of them I would like the Browns to win some games, make it a more positive story. And another one I feel like after doing it, I kind of have a better outline for how I would present, how it would go about it. Yeah, for sure. Well, um, it was it was a challenge. In so out of the hundred things you have, like but some favorite. of the stories I was I was dying to well, tell. Um, <laughs> so um, let's see. The one that comes to mind is you know um, the winningest quarterback ever in the new stadium. The quarterback that's won the most games as a starter in the new Brown Stadium. Well, here's a name. Uh, 99 when the Browns came back. Yeah, I don't even know. When was the new stadium? Uh, yeah, well, 99 he doesn't play for the Browns. It's Ben Roethlisberger. <laughs> Not, well, my Browns is so bad. Baker yeah, should I've... pass it this year. But right now, it goes. Uh, oh, my gosh. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's great. So that's been rough. Um, that's just one of the things that comes to mind. So wow. it was cool to dive back. You know, it was, it's based in the new era of Browns. But it was cool to dive back into when the Browns were great. And Jim Brown, was cool to uh, um, you know, Nick Chubb last year was the best season by a Browns running back to not name Jim Brown. That's what that means. Yeah, yeah. Nick Chubb last year was the best season by a Browns running back to not name Jim Brown. That's what that means. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, well, and I didn't know with that question if it was percentage or if it was total. I was trying to find a quarterback who was maybe 1-0 and in a quick game, you know. But, um, hey, Zach, we're going to – it's kind of a rapid fire to finish. I call this three-pointers, the, the old basketball reference. So, being a point guard here uh, who likes to shoot this time, I'm going to dish off to you because I know how good of a shooter you were for the, the JV team for four years at Manchester, right? No. Uh, hey, if people um, could, number one, if people could take one thing we're from on this your talk side. and just grab love football. onto it, you know, um, and maybe make it a football. We want to be successful and relevant in, like, living, breathing, functional organizations, um, that we are thorough in, in what we do, and we want to be living, breathing, functional organizations, um, that we are thorough. If, if you could have come over here today um, and asked I, you know, the one thing questions, that I kind of just what's mentally question, prepared one question that I didn't change, ask that I should have asked you today? You know, like I said, when I started at clevelandbrowns.com, it was brand new. We were like buying billboards and t-shirts, letting people know, hey, there's a website. You can look up every player and we'll cover the team every day. We were like, you know, when I came up, Kevin, I, I mentioned I, I wanted to do this, but, you know, I wanted to work for the Beacon Journal or the Plain Dealer and hopefully y'all you know, illustrate it. You know, every, I would say this, every full-time job I've had did not exist when I was in high school. Mm -hmm. That was only 22 years ago. So every, the, world, the world and specifically the journalism business had changed. Did not exist when I was in high school. That was only 22 years ago. Wow. The world and specifically the journalism business had changed. 
Yeah, for sure. Yeah, you alluded to some of those things earlier, which was good. Um, well, as you know, this is just called good stuff. Just, I don't know, something I've always uh, said, but like, you know, what, what's I, I, some listen, good I, I stuff blessed, you can um, give us in closing folks, anything that you, you know, feel is appropriate? Yes, there's time. days when my job stinks or I don't like it or the Browns stink or somebody's mad at me for something I wrote, yeah. right? But there's a lot of days where I'm around the sports world. I got to sit in the draft room for three years. You know, I've been to the Final Four on different levels of the NCAA tournament, covered the College World Series. So, you know, I feel like it's been awesome to me. Um, you know, I don't feel like I've ever worked a day in my life. It's not feeling time. And, uh, you know, I, I like to come on and talk about this, to think about to my young self that, hey, when you're 40, like, you don't know what a podcast is, but you're going to spend 40 minutes, like, just telling jokes and telling Manchester football stories and arguing about NFL players, right, and making NCAA brackets. And, like, people are going to listen to that. Like, hey, I've done okay. Good stuff. Right? And making NCAA brackets. And, like, people are going to listen to that. Like, yeah, right. Yeah, right. Yeah, for sure. Well, um, how about in closing here? How, how can people I, – I don't want them to get on your Wikipedia page and go to that ZachJackson.com and mistake that that's you uh, when I was looking at Well, into I would that. say how, the main avenue is find Twitter, out about uh, Akron Jackson. You know, where can so they I'm find you on Jackson social on Instagram media? Too, but Twitter you know, is where, all that. Um, you know, we, we tweet all of our athletic work. Uh, I'm on Facebook as well. So uh, if you Google me, Z-A-C, my mom will fight you if you try to go with the H or the K or something like that. Um, Zach Jackson, Akron Jackson. I'm on Twitter every single day, for better or worse. Uh, I'm on the other platforms a little less. And, you know, this is the time, even though the schedule's different and delayed this year, that we'll be covering the Browns from every minute, every angle uh, through August and September, getting ready for what we hope will be the start of the season on September 13th. Every minute, every angle through August and September, getting ready for what we hope will be. I've been called way worse than that, Kevin. Let's put it that way. Right. And hopefully people don't get you confused with Zach Efron, too, when they're typing that in, you know, when that pops up on there. Well, hey, Zach, man, I, I appreciate you making the time here today. I, I've enjoyed this. I know some people are going to uh, listen in and enjoy that as well. You, you brought some vibe. Yes, watch that text seven point stories. guard. got to stick together. Always love your humor and uh, just always appreciate staying in touch with you here over the years as well. Yes, watch that text seven point guard. got to stick together. Yeah, this is true. <laughs> this is very true. You know, I forgot to give a shout out. on my, my, my niece made this great drawing of me on this canvas, so I told yeah, her no I'd problem. give her a shout out here for her. Her 10th. I don't know if that, that's a good thing or a bad thing, but no, hey, nonetheless, thanks for joining me today, Zach. I, I really do appreciate it, man. Uh, and, and, and good luck with whatever thanks, whatever buddy. the year brings. I know you and I will be in touch, maybe a little less if it's not college football, but you know, we'll, we'll continue to stay in touch nonetheless. Thanks, buddy. Yeah, well, hey, everybody, thanks again for joining us. Uh, as I said at the beginning, and as always, you know, please reach out, touch base. I love hearing from you. I love talking to you about all these episodes. And uh, big thanks to Zach for joining us once again. And until next time, good stuff.